السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضاه وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد So inshallah ta'ala we're going to continue with our class for the sisters bi'idnillahi ta'ala uh, and before we begin with today's section, we wanted to go over some of the questions that were left from last week. And actually, one of the questions is from the week before last week, I believe. So we're going to go over the questions, inshallah, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, covering the uh, next section in the book of Sheikh Salih Al Fawzan, Hafidahullah Ta'ala. So, with regards to the questions, uh, one of the questions was, what if you already had tattoos prior to being Muslim? Do you need to remove them? And I believe that the the question came up because we had mentioned in the last class the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الْوَاشِمَاتِ وَالْمُتَوَشِّمَاتِ وَالنَّامِسَاتِ وَالْمُتَنَمِّسَاتِ وَالْمُتَفَلِّجَاتِ لِلْحَسْنَ الْمَغَيِّرَاتِ خَلْقِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the curse of Allah is upon the uh, one who has tattoos done, and the, uh, or the one who uh, tattoos and the one who has tattoos done to her. And the woman who has extensions in her hair and the one who has extensions put in her hair. And the one who uh, files her teeth to put a space in between them for the sake of beauty, to change the nature of the creation of Allah azza wa jal. So I believe that's why the, the question came up. Right? And so the question was, uh, what if you already had t- tattoos prior to being Muslim? Do you need to remove them? Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he mentioned this, this same hadith or one of the variations of this particular hadith. And he mentions, وَإِذَا فَعَلَهُ الْمُسْلِمْ فِي حَالِ جَهْلِهِ بِالتَّحْرِيمِ أَوْ عَمِلَ بِهَا الْوَشْمْ فِي حَالِ صِغَرِهِ فَإِنَّهُ يَلْزِمْ إِزَالَتُهُ بَعْدَ عِلْمِهِ بِالتَّحْرِيمِ He said that if the Muslim, if he does these types of things, right, like the, the tattoos and so forth, when he was in a state of ignorance concerning the tahrim, the unlawfulness of the tattoos, right, or he has the tattoo done when he was young, right, that he was a child and he didn't know any better, uh, then it is binding upon him to remove that a tattoo after he learns that it is haram, right? After he learns that it is unlawful. لكن إذا كان في إزالته مشقة أو مضرة فإنه يكفيه التوبة والاستغفار ولا يضره بقاؤه في جسمه. However, if there is a great deal of difficulty involved in the removal of this tattoo or some harm that may occur to him uh, as a result of that, then it is enough for him to make tawbah to repent to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Uh, and it is of no harm to him to let that tattoo remain upon his body. And some of the other ulama they mentioned that he should, you know, do his best to try to cover it up, not make a display of it, you know, especially for if if it's if it's women, not to make a display of it, uh, and so forth. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala knows best. Um, then we had another question from last week, which was in regards to wearing the bun in the back of the head. How is a sister supposed to gather her hair to wear the hijab? Most sisters with long hair do this to be able to wear the khimar slash hijab comfortably. So, um, you know, this question, I was worried that maybe I missed something or maybe I'm not understanding something with regards to this this question, right? So we we mentioned last week the the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he prohibited uh, you know, g- gathering up the hair in a bun on, on top of the head and also in the in the back of the head, right? And also uh, parting the hair on the side, right? Because the, the hair of the woman is parted in the middle of the head, right? And so these were things that were prohibited by the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now with regards to how to gather the hair in the back of the head, uh, right? Shaykh Al-Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned, فَإِذَا كَانَ الشَّعْرُ فَوْقَ فَفِيهِ نَهِ That if the hair is gathered on top of the head, then this is something that is prohibited, right? as we learned from the hadith. 
أما إذا كان على على رقبة مثلا مثلا فإن هذا لا بأس به إلا إذا كانت المرأة ستخرج إلى إلى السوق. Uh, he says, as for when the woman has the bun on the on the back of her of her head at the nape of the neck, right? So he's talking about lowering it down to the nape of the neck. Uh, for example, then he said, la ba'asabihi. There's no problem with this unless the woman is going out to the marketplace, right? Unless she's going out to the marketplace, having that, you know, at the back of her her head or the hair, you know, done up in a bun like that, at the back of her head at the nape of the neck. فَإِنَّهُ فِي هَذِهِ الْحَالِ يَكُونُ مِنَ التبرج. Because now, when she has that bun at the, at the nape of her neck, right? Even if it's lowered down to the nape of her neck, now when she goes out like that, then this is a form of tabarruj. This is a form of displaying her beauty. لِأَنَّهُ سَيَكُونُ لَهُ عَلَامَ مَنْ وَرَاءَ الْعَبَاءَةِ تَظْهَرٌ Because it's going to be something that, uh, you know, is going to be noticed, right? And the, at the back of her, her aba and so forth. وَيَكُونُ هَذَا مِنْ بَابِ التَّبَرُّجِ وَمِنْ أَسْبَابِ الْفِتْنَةِ فَلَا يَجُوزُ And so since this is from the causes or from the, the ways of having tabarruj, displaying her beauty, and it's from the causes of fitna, then therefore this is not permissible. Right? So what I was concerned about with regards to this question, right, was that, I mean, I, I'm not the most knowledgeable as far as the different ways that the sisters can wear their hair, but I mean, even me, I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of a number of different ways that a woman can wear her hair without having to make it a bun on top of her head or behind her head. You know, like, I don't know that that's a particular issue. And I had to call, you know, some of the brothers and ask, right, am I missing something here? And, and you know, the, the answer that I got was no. There, there's a number of different ways, you know, you can uh, have the hair, you know, in a, in a long braid. And the thing is, you know, how is a sister supposed to gather her hair to wear the hijab? If the hijab that we're talking about fits the criteria of being a proper hijab, I don't see that there's going to be a problem. You know, you can tuck the hair into the into the overgarment, into various, you know, garments that you're wearing, if you're wearing a proper hijab, right? And, you know, when you say most sisters with long hair do this to be able to wear the hijab comfortably, you know, Allahu alam, perhaps most sisters are wrong, right? Uh, if they're If they're wearing the bun at the back of the head, Right in under their hijabs, and, and I think some of this, you know, there's like a, there's a bit of a pattern here that I want to bring attention to because you know last week we had another question about uh, what if you have a young girl who's 12 years of age and the hair is too long for for the hijab, can we cut the hair? You know, the 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 thing that the sisters have to realize is having long hair. This is part of the beauty that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has uh, endowed you with. You know, so instead of just looking for all the excuses to cut the hair, you know, I would hope that the the sisters realize that this is a blessing from Allah, right? I mean, speak to the sisters who have defects or who are unable to grow their hair properly, right? And you'll realize very quickly that those of you who are blessed to have long hair, that this is something that is a blessing from Allah. And we should be looking for ways to maintain that, right? Not looking for ways to cut the hair and to imitate the non-Muslim woman and so on and so forth, right? So even like the question... Uh, for the for the young girl, you know, whose hair is too long for the hijab, have you thought about getting a larger hijab? At twelve, girls are still growing, right? So it would make sense to get you know a proper hijab that isn't is it, that is in conformity to the sunnah. We're not talking about those hijabs that people just wrap around their head, right? That's not the definition of a hijab. That's something we're going to get into later about what is the proper way for the Muslim woman to cover, right? So maybe part of the problem here is that the sisters are not wearing proper covering and that's why they're having these problems with the hair right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best but in general you know we hope that the sisters would realize that having the hair long is part of the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed them with and so they should do their best to wear their hair in in a way that is in conformity to the sunnah and 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 to not look for ways to you know uh, disobey Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam طيب then there was another question uh, that came up, uh, and the question was, can it be stipulated in a marriage contract that a woman is not allowed to remarry if she is widowed? Right? Can it be stipulated in the marriage contract that a woman is not allowed to remarry if she is widowed? Right? We would advise any of the brothers who are trying to put this in the contract, 
you know, you're obligating something upon the sister that Allah and His Messenger وسلم, has not obligated upon them. Right? And we remind them of the authentic hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is found in the Sahih al-Bukhari where he said, مَا بَالُ أُنَاسًا يَشْتَرِتُونَ شُرُوطًا لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that what is wrong with a people who stipulate conditions that are not found in the Book of Allah. مَنْ اشْتَرَتَ شَرْطًا لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ بَاطِنٌ وَإِنْ اشْتَرَتَ مِئَةَ شَرْطٍ And that uh, every condition that is stipulated that is not found in the Book of Allah, then it is falsehood, even if it is a hundred conditions. شَرْطَ اللَّهِ أَحَقُّ وَأَوْثَقُ And the conditions of Allah uh, have more right to be adhered to and they are more trustworthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Will that apply to the, um, to the sister trying to put that stipulation to not to get another husband also? No, it would. And the people of knowledge have mentioned that, yeah. It's, 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 uh, you know, and the thing is, you know, I would hope that people realize these things before they sign these contracts, right? Mm-hmm. And, and make things binding upon themselves that Allah and His Messenger did not make binding. Allahu Tabarak wa Ta'ala knows best. Is that one, what that hadith you mentioned in the beginning, is that the same hadith that when a sister came to a brother and said, that you said that this is in the book of Allah, I read the whole Quran? No, no, that's different. That's, that's different. different. That's different. Okay. That's different. Right. Tayyib, inshallah. So, continuing in the uh, book of Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, Tanbihat al-Ahkam in Takhtasu bil Mu'minat. Uh, we're continuing uh, still in the chapter uh, dealing with the uh, the adornment of the woman with regards to her body. Uh, and so he mentions ذكر ذلك ابن كثير في تفسيره وقد ابتلي بهذه الآفة الخطيرة التي هي كبيرة من كبائر الذنوب كثير من النساء اليوم. Right. So we're still talking about. The issue of the hair extensions and so forth. And he mentions that Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions in his tafsir that uh, many of the women today, meaning many of the women in his time, uh, have been tried by this uh, dangerous practice, which is a major sin from the major sins, right? He's referring to the issue of having the hair extensions, right? He says, Hatta asbaha nams. To the point that the hair extensions have become something that are looked at as a daily necessity. And it is not permissible for the woman to obey her husband if he commands her to do that, if he commands her to put extensions in her hair. Because this is disobedience, right? Disobedience to who? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لا طاعة الخلق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience to the creation and disobedience to the creator. طيب uh, So then he, the, the next, this was the statement of Ibn Kathir. Then Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan moves on and he says, وَيَحْرَمْ عَلَى الْمَرْأَةِ الْمُسْلِمَةِ تَفْلِيجْ أَسْنَانِهَا لِلْحَسَنِ بِأَنَّهَا تَبْرِدُهَا and this is a thing, I don't know if this is common anymore, but this was common in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He mentions that it is haram for the Muslim woman to uh, put spaces between her teeth, right? To put a gap between her teeth for the sake of beautification. Uh, and to use, you know, files, you know, filing the teeth and so forth. To, to make that uh, space for the sake of beauty. أَمَّا إِذَا كَانَتَ الْأَسْنَانَ فِيهَا تَشْوِيهِ وَتَحْتَاجُ إِلَىٰ عَمَلِيَّةِ تَعْدِيلِ لِإِزَالَةِ هَذَا التَّشْوِيهِ أَوْ فِيهَا تَسُوسِ وَحْتَاجَتْ إِلَىٰ إِصْلَاحِهَا مِنْ أَجْلِ إِزَالَةِ ذَلِكَ فَلَا بَأْسِ As for when someone has some kind of a, uh, a deformity or something you know, in their teeth that needs to be fixed, Right, or they have some kind of you know cavity or so forth, or something that needs to be done uh, surgically to you know fix their teeth or to you know clean their teeth and so forth. And all of this, obviously, this does not fall under that prohibition. Right, this is not what we are referring to. Right, or like for example, someone gets braces to straighten their teeth and so forth. Right, that's not part of the prohibition. لِأَنَّ ذَلِكَ 
لِأَنَّ هَذَا مِنْ بَابِ الْعِلَاجِ وَإِزَالَةِ التَّشْوِيهِ Because this is from this falls under the category of treatment and removing you know deformities. وَيَكُونُ ذَلِكَ عَلَى يَدِ طَبِيبَةٍ مُخْتَصَّةٍ And and that is something that happens at the hands of a specialized female doctor. Right? For the woman, they would go and have a female doctor who specializes in dentistry, right, to do this for them. So this does not fall under the prohibition. طيب. Then Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he says, وَيَحْرَمْ عَلَى الْمَرْأَةِ عَمَلِ الْوَشْمْ فِي جِسْمِهَا that it is haram, it is unlawful for the woman to have a tattoo placed on her body. لِأَنَّ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ لَعَنَ الْوَاشِمَ وَالْمُتَوَشِّمَ Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he cursed the washima and the mutawashima. وَالْوَاشِمَ هِيَ الَّتِي تَغْرَزَ الْيَدْ أو الوجه بالإبر. And the washima, that is the woman who, uh, you know, puts the, the, the imprint Right of the tattoo on the person's uh, hand or their face, right? With the the ibr, the whatever you would call it, the, the injection or whatever they they use, right? The tattoo gun mm-hmm. and, and so forth. The what? Like the needle. Yeah, the needle, right? ثم ذلك المكان بالكهل أو المداد. And then they fill that place with kohl uh, antimony or ink, right? That's how they make the tattoo. Right, so that that's the the woman, that's the washima, the one who does the tattoos, right? Wal mutawash wal wal mustawshima, afwan wal mustawshima hi alati yafalu yafalu biha dalik, and the mustawshima, she is the one who has that done to her, right? She has the tattoo done to her. Wa hada amadun muharram wa kabira min kabair al dunub, and so this is an act that is haram, it is unlawful, and it is a major sin from the major sins. لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لعن من فعلته أو فعل بها because the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has cursed the woman who does it and the one who has it done to her واللعن لا يكون إلا على كبيرة من الكبائر and the the لعن when Allah and His Messenger curse someone this is only done for something that is considered a major sin from the major sins طيب Uh, then Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan, he moves on and he mentions حكم الخضاب للنساء وصبغ الشعر والتحلي بالذهب right? So he's going to mention three more issues. The first is, uh, or I guess two more, two more issues really. The ruling on dyeing or coloring the hair for the woman and the ruling on beautifying oneself or adorning oneself with gold. Right? So for the first issue, الخضاب, dyeing the hair, he says, قال الإمام النووي رحمه الله أما خضاب اليدين أو الرجلين بالحناء فمستحب للمتزوجة من النساء للأحاديث المشهورة فيه. Uh, so he says, as for the خضاب, which is you know dyeing the or what he's referring to now is coloring the hands or the feet with henna, right? So we're not talking about dyeing the hair necessarily yet, right? But as for covering the hands and the feet with henna, then this is something that is mustahab. This is something that is recommended for the woman who is married, right? So this is one of the ways that she beautifies herself for her husband, right? It's mustahab. It's highly recommended for her to dye her hands and feet, we're talking about, right? Well, for her husband. Due to the ahadith that are well known about this particular issue. And so, Sheikh, this is the comment of Al Imam Al Nawawi. Sheikh Salih Al Fawzan, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, he comments and he says, Yashiru ila ma rawahu Abu Dawood. That, the, that the, the author here, he's referring to that which has been related by Abu Dawood, uh, where it says, Amra'a sa'alata Aisha radiallahu anha an khidab al hina. That there was a woman who asked Aisha radiallahu anha about, uh, you know, using the, the henna. And so the hadith says, the Aisha says, لا بأس به. There is no problem with it. ولكني أكرهه. كان حبيبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يكره ريحه. And so Aisha رضي الله عنها, uh, she mentions that I don't. There's no problem with it. However, I dislike it because my beloved 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to dislike its smell, and there is some uh, discussion amongst the people of knowledge with regards to the authenticity of this hadith. What seems to be most correct is this particular hadith is actually not authentic. Allah subhanahu wa taala knows best. All right, then the the other narration that he mentions is uh, found in the collection of An Nasai, also from Aisha radhiyallahu anha, who said that. Uh, there was a woman that came to the Messenger of Allah uh, and she signaled with her hand or she made a gesture with her hand from behind a veil indicating that she had a letter for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَقَبِضَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ يَدُهُ So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he withdrew and closed his hand and he said مَا أَدْرِي أَيَدُ رَجُلٍ أَمْ يَدُ أَمْرَأَةٍ he said, I don't know if that is the hand of a man or the hand of a woman. قالت, بل يد so the woman said, rather it is the hand of a woman. قال, لو, uh, لو كنت امرأة لغير, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that if this was the hand of a woman, that she would have uh, changed the color of her fingernails with henna. Right, because this is something that the woman used to do. They used to color their fingernails with henna. Uh, Sheikh Salih Al Fawzan he says, "لكن لا تصبغ أذفارها بما يتجمد عليها ويمنع الطهارة." However, uh, it is not permissible for her to color her fingernails with something that is going to set on top of the nails, right? And therefore, it's going to prohibit. The uh, pur- uh, the purification of the ablution, right? So, for example, a woman can color her hair with um, henna, and henna it it you know it colors the nails, but it doesn't cover them, right? There's a difference, right? Just like when she would put henna on her hands and her feet, right? The the color sets, but there's no there's no covering that is set on there. I mean, there is a covering, but you would remove the the covering of the henna afterwards. Then it's just the imprint that's left by the color. Right, but it's not actually covering the hands or the feet or the nails. Right, when the woman put on nail polish, that's different. Right, so they can put on nail polish, but when it comes time to make salat, if they don't already have wudu and they have to make wudu, they can't make wudu properly with the nail polish still on. Right, there's the authentic hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam where the man came to him and you know he had made wudu. And the Messenger of Allah asked him to repeat the wudu because he still had a spot that was the size of a coin or a fingernail that was on his foot that still had not, the water had not reached there. And so the wudu was not valid, right? So if the if the woman were to, for example, wear some nail polish to beautify herself for her husband, she can do that, but she's got to realize that when it comes time to for her to make wudu, when it's time for the salat, she's going to have to remove that nail polish Right, in order for her wudu to be valid. طيب. Uh, then, uh, moving on to the next issue, Sheikh Salih Fawzan mentions, As for the woman dyeing or coloring her hair, the hair on her head. فَإِنْ كَانَ شَيْبًا فَإِنَّهَا تُصْبِغُهُ بِغَيْرِ السَّوَادِ لِعُمُومِ النَّهِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم عن, عَنْ الشِبْغِ بِالسَّوَادِ he says, as for if the woman is older and she has gray hair, right? Her hair has gone gray. Then uh, it is permissible for her to dye the hair, but not to use the the color black, right? Not to dye it black. Because of the general prohibition of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa from dyeing the hair black. And he narrates again from Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, rahimahullahu ta'ala, this time from his book, Riyad al-Salihin, where he has... باب نهي الرجل والمرأة عن الخضاب في شعرهما بالسواد. Right, the chapter of the prohibition of the man and the woman from dyeing their hair black. Right, and so the point that he's drawing here is that the the hadith prohibits dyeing the hair black in general. And Imam al Nawawi he understood from this. Right, in his chapter title he mentioned that this is a prohibition for the man and the woman. Right, that both of them have been prohibited from dyeing their hair black. And then he mentions that Imam al we further says in Al-Majmu' وَلَا فَرْقَ فِي الْمَنْعِ 
من الخضاب بالسواد بين الرجل والمرأة هذا مذهبنا He says that there is no difference as it relates to the man and the woman concerning the prohibition of dyeing the hair black. Right? The prohibition is for both, for the men and for the women, for dyeing their hair black. And this is our madhab, right? This is our school of law on this particular issue. طيب. So then, he, uh, uh, Sheikh Saul Fawzan continues, he says, وَأَمَّا سِبْغِ الْمَرْأَ لِشَعْرِ رَأْسِهَا الْأَسْوَدِ ليتحول إلى لون آخر فالذي أرى أن هذا لا يجوز So now outside of dyeing the hair uh, black or the prohibition of dyeing the hair black for a woman to dye her hair a color that is not you know that is a completely different color right to change the, the color to her hair to a completely different color he said then I hold that this is not permissible لأنه لا داعي إليه because there is no need for her to do that, right? It's one thing, for example, in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the, you know, they, you could, they would, uh, you know, dye their beards when the beards became gray with henna, right? And it's like a brownish, orangish kind of color that it, that it leaves on you, right? But as for someone just completely, you know, saying, well, I'm going to dye my, my hair blonde, right? And and you're, you're not anywhere near being Caucasian, right? It's a completely different hair color for you. Sheikh Salah al-Fawzan is saying that I hold this to be not permissible because there's no need for you to do that. طيب لأن السواد بالنسبة للشعر جمال وليس تشويهها يحتاج إلى تغيير ولأن في ذلك تشبها بالكافرات Right, so the 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 blackness of the hair, right, or the darkness of the hair, is part of the the beauty of the hair. So now, when it begins to go gray as you get older, then it's permissible to use henna and those types of things to, you know, not show off the gray so much, but to you know turn it back to a color that is closer to to what it used to be, even if it's not exactly like that. But to dye the hair in a way that resembles the disbelieving woman, this is something that is not permissible. طيب. Then uh, the the last issue for today, وَيُبَاحُ لِلْمَرْأَ أَن تَتَحَلَّ بِالذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ that it is permissible for the woman to uh, beautify and adorn herself with gold and silver, right? It is permissible for the woman to adorn herself with gold and silver, بِمَا جَرَتْ بِهِ الْعَادَةِ right in in whatever way is customary. You know where where she is at. Wahada bi ijma'al ulama, and the scholars have a consensus on this particular issue that it is permissible for the woman to adorn herself with gold and silver. Lakin la yajuzu laha an tadhara haliha lirijal ghair al maharim. However, it is not permissible for her to make a display of her adornment to men who are not mahram to her, right? Who are not her husbands. Her brothers, her father, and so on and so forth. To the end of that list. بل تستره خصوصا عند الخروج من البيت وتعرض للنظر الرجال إليها لأن ذلك فتنة. Rather, she should conceal her adornment, right, from the men who are not mahram to her, especially when she leaves to go out of the house, because if she displays her adornment, this is going to attract the looks of the men to her. And that will result in fitna. وَقَدْ نُحِيَةً تَسْمَعُ وَقَدْ نُحِيَةً تَسْمَعُ الرِّجَالِ صَوْتَ حِلِيهَا الَّذِي فِي رِجْلِهَا تَحْتَ الثِّيَابِ And he brings us an example of that, that, the, that it is prohibited uh, for the men to hear the, what do you call those things, the ankle bracelets, right? That she has uh, on her feet, right? Underneath her clothes. So even though the ankle bracelets are covered by her clothes, right? She can make noise with them, and even that is prohibited. And he brings the ayah from the Quran where Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala he said, Wala tadrimna bi arjulihinna liyu'lama ma yukhfina min zinatihinna. So do not let the woman stamp their feet so as to make known to the men that which is hidden from their adornments. Right? So the women were prohibited from stamping their feet because that those brace those ankle bracelets would create a sound which would attract the looks of the men, even though the ankle bracelet itself is covered up by the clothes, but when they stamp their feet, it makes a particular sound, right? A jingling 
sound that attracts the attention of the men. And so the women were prohibited from stamping their feet because this would bring the attention of the men to them. Right? And so this is what Sheikh Salih Fawzan is saying, that she can wear gold and silver. She's doing that to beautify herself for her husband and so forth. But she should be aware of wearing these things when she's in the presence of men who are non-mahram to her. Right? Especially when she leaves to go out to do something outside of the house. Right? And so Sheikh Salih Fawzan says, فَكَيْفَ bil حَلِيَ الظَّاهِرِ That if this is how she's been prohibited from making a display of adornments that are covered, what if she were to go out and actually display her gold and silver adornment? Now, that would be even more prohibited. Even this ayah, by the way, was from Surah An-Nur, ayah number 31. طيب. So that brings us to the end الحمد, of the chapter on the adornment of the body. And inshallah ta'ala, uh, next week, we're going to begin the third chapter, Al Fasl al Thalith, which is Ahkam Tahtasu Bil Haydi Wal Istihada Wal Nifas, the rulings and regulations that are pertaining to uh, menstruation and postpartum bleeding and so forth. Tayyib, so if anyone, I don't see any questions in the chat uh, so far, yeah. unless they show up after I, after I go offline. You wanted to um, bring up from uh, Yusuf yesterday, the two? And you say you want to do well, no, we're, we're going to do this for, those for the Ramadan class, right? Oh. Yeah, we're going to do this for the Ramadan class, inshallah. So, inshallah, if there's nothing else, then we'll we'll stop here. Anyway, yeah, so but, but we're, we're going to deal with that in the Ramadan class as well, inshallah. inshallah. So, we'll stop here. Uh, if we get any other questions, inshallah, we'll deal with them next week, bidnillahi ta'ala, in detail. Subhanakallahumma la ilaha la anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.